over here we have uh, Dr. Bidushi who used to uh, work at NASA as a rocket scientist. Uh, I think she worked at JPL yep. as well as uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. So that uh, Hubble Space Telescope just turned 25 a few days ago, so congratulations on your project. Thank you, makes me feel old. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, so Dr. Bidushi, could you just tell us a little bit about uh, what you used to do in NASA as well as uh, what you're doing right now? Okay. Yeah. So um, in NASA, I did a variety of things. I worked mostly on software. Okay. So I did everything from um, confirming and testing various image processing software packages. Um, I did observer support where people actually subscribe to use an instrument like the Hubble Space Telescope. You put in a proposal and a team decides whether you can observe your object or not. Mm -hmm. And people like that would get trained in how to actually analyze their observations. Mm -hmm. And I've also written software to model the dust ring around the Earth. Wow. Um, I've written software that um, looks at asteroids. Mm -hmm. it's just a whole bunch of stuff over the different years. Yeah, so that was my first job out of college. Wow. Yeah. And so then they launched, and a few months after launch, as we were going through the verification phase, there was an anomaly found in the mirror. Oh, right. And so the mirror basically had what's called a spherical aberration. It's like um, an astigmatism for a person. So the light was not focusing into a point. It was more of a blur. And so for us, that meant job security. Because we had to go in and recharacterize all the instruments. And then um, after we characterized the instruments, they were able to do limited science with the, the system that they had. And a few years later, um, NASA sent up a space shuttle to the space shuttle a bunch of astronauts who inter um, put in corrective optics. Mm. Right? Spectacles. So, yeah, basically spectacles, right? It was called COSPAR, corrective opti optics. Something. And so the, that instrument was put in front of the um, actual cameras, mm -hmm. and it limited the field of view a little bit, but it made a correction. Mm -hmm. And so Hubble's been returning spectacular images you mm -hmm. know, since then. And I think one of the most exciting things I did at JPL was um, I was on the team that verified the first set of images that came down from the first Mars Pathfinder rover. Mm -hmm. So that was in the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. And so there were these images we were looking at where the, I mean, the parachute that it was in was de deployed and you could see the wheel of the rover and then see the deflated parachute on the side and the Martian landscape. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the first people on planet Earth to actually be able to look at that. Wow. That was just amazing. So, I mean, it's just a real privilege to be paid to do something like that. And so when I was a kid, there were two experiences that really did it for me. Mm -hmm. One was I was in fifth grade, 10 mm -hmm. years old, and we had to write a book report. Mm -hmm. And I chose to write one on Jupiter. Mm -hmm. and. I realized all of a sudden that this thing in the sky was actually a place. Mm. And then I realized Mars is actually a place where they think they can land someday. Mm. And it was just mind-blowing to me that you could actually think of these objects as locations, not just spots in the sky. And that got me really excited. And I loved Jupiter so much, I did my PhD on Jupiter. Wow. Um, and then the other thing was watching us land on Mars in 1976 on TV. Mm -hmm. So back then you couldn't record anything. Mm -hmm. You just knew when things were going to be on and you, everybody sat around waiting for that magical moment. So on the evening news they showed pictures of Mars and we got these images down where the sky was blue. Mm -hmm. And then the next day we got the same images corrected saying that actually the sky is pink on Mars because of the atmospheric composition. Mm -hmm. And at that moment I realized, oh my gosh, so people are actually doing stuff to make these images <laughs> and it hadn't I mean I you know I was 10 years old I hadn't really thought about mm -hmm. the whole process but the fact was people were actually involved in making these images for the public and that just got me really excited so I was hooked on astronomy from grade school yeah. you know Singapore is in a really good position right now to move into space science mm -hmm. The knowledge is there, and people like you are learning about satellite systems and cameras in college and university. And so as the workforce builds up here, I think there are going to be more and more people who are capable of doing this stuff. Now you just have to get people excited about it and have them go out and look at the sky for themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's all it's going to take. We hope we get there. Yeah. So 
And one of the things that I think is really amazing about NASA and astronomy is you've got Spitzer, you've got um, the Hubble, you've got the um, Chandra, you've mm -hmm. got lots of different wavelengths. So they look at a lot of objects in different wavelengths mm -hmm. and put together these composites that are just amazing. So it's, it's kind of like what Tiny Mouse is going to do but in multiple wavelengths, because you guys are going to take images and stack them, right? Yeah, that's right. And just that way you get a much higher quality, better detailed image. Mm -hmm. And so NASA's been doing that um, with different wavelengths with different telescopes for a long time. So mm -hmm. you're following in their footsteps, which I think is <laughs> pretty cool. Well, yeah. mm. uh, I don't think we're anywhere near as advanced as NASA. We just hope that uh, people on Earth can get a, a better glimpse of uh, the Milky Way and things like that. So I, yeah. that's, see, I think that's really cool because mm -hmm. you're providing um, access, like direct access to people. Mm -hmm. So if somebody can look at an object in the sky and then they can actually capture their experience for somebody else, and it's going to be a much better system than just your standard camera. Mm -hmm. right? So I, I think it's really exciting. Thank you. <laughs> so um, every year for past 20, 25 years since I've been married. Mm -hmm. Every year we go up to the Sierra Nevada mountains in California and we go to this area called Mosquito Flats mm -hmm. and up there you can stay in cabins that are around 10,000 feet altitude, that's you know, over 3,000 meters. And when you look out at the sky there, you, it feels like you can touch the stars. The air is so clean and crisp and the stars are so bright. And it's like what you were saying about Orion. You can't find the Big Dipper. Yeah. There's so many stars, you actually have to be able to point them out. Mm -hmm. And um, if it's a moonless night, you can actually be guided and walk by the light of the Milky Way. Oh. Yeah, it's just an amazing place. And I hope everybody, at least once in their lifetimes, gets a chance to go somewhere like that. Because when you look at the vastness of the universe, and when you look at the stars, you look at the Milky Way, you realize how minuscule and puny we are you know, here on planet Earth. Our lifetimes are so short, mm -hmm. yet we're able to look up and see light from other stars that's hitting our eye, light that's been traveling for hundreds of millions of years, mm -hmm. in some cases from galaxies. It's, it's just really inspirational. And I'm glad you asked that, because I hope everybody gets to find a spot like that at some point. Yeah. I, okay, I think that's the end of our interview. So thanks. thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me.